Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome from uh, Washington to our virtual event in which we're trying to bring Europe and the United States closer together at a time that we have many challenges where we need to stand together and where we need to be stronger together also. Just like trade and investment is a two-way street, uh, today is also about interacting and hearing from one another, uh, from the different perspectives we have represented here. So I will be encouraging you later to join us in our networking event after these uh, discussions and to raise also questions in the discussions we're about to have. I'll share some more details on that uh, later on how you can participate. Before we start our uh, discussion, I would like to uh, hear from two leading voices that we have uh, and that will lay the land for us this morning. We have governor of the governor of Colorado, Jared Polis, and we have the European Union ambassador to the United States, Mr. Stavros Lambrinidis. Governor Polis has a unique perspective on trade and investment as he's both an entrepreneur as well as a politician and a public servant and a leader in education. After launching several successful companies, Governor Polis committed himself to making sure other Coloradans had the opportunity to pursue their dreams through founding schools for at-risk students and new immigrants and starting also nonprofits to help veterans. Prior to serving as governor, Jared Polis was uh, the state, uh, state Board of Education and he represented Colorado's second congressional district here in Washington. Governor Polis is joined by our very own EU ambassador to the United States, Stavros Lambrinidis. Ambassador Lambrinidis has a distinguished career in the Greek public service, including having served as Greeks, Greece's foreign minister before focusing on European Union policy matters first as a member and then the vice president of the European Parliament, and he later became the EU special representative for human rights. In March 2019, he became the EU's top representative in the United States, working out of Washington, D.C., but I know he's always keen to connect with Americans from all walks of life around this great country. Ambassador, Governor, the floor is yours. We look forward to hearing from you uh, and setting the scene for our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, very much for, uh, for kicking this off. And uh, Governor Polis, it's, it's uh, such, a, uh, such an honor to have you with us uh, to kick off this, uh, this event, our first uh, 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 virtual trade ambassadors event between the EU and the, and the Mountain West. Uh, my first question to, uh, to you, Governor, as we kick this off is, uh, I am I the first person to compliment you on your beautiful Greek sounding last name? Or have there been others in your life who've done so? Uh, no, I, it's, it's, uh, yeah, thank you. It's, um, and I'm, I'm actually uh, not, not Greek, but I do um, really enjoy cooking spanakopita for the family. It's one of my favorite dishes <laughs> to make. And uh, I think I'm Greek by cultural affiliation. So uh, if not by yeah, that's, that's brilliant. And indeed, for those who watched us, polis means city and then politics even uh, comes uh, exactly out of that. It is the, it is the 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 act of citizens, um, uh, you know, governing themselves. Well, and, uh, and an ambassador, you know, uh, from somebody in in politics who has to run for office, if it helps you vote for, if if you're going to vote for me because you think I'm Greek, then by all means I'll be Greek, right? So I'm happy <laughs> to happy to be Greek where appropriate. That's fantastic, Governor. It's um, we 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 are running this at, 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 at probably uh, you know a, a brilliant time. Um, uh, during uh, uh, election season and COVID season. Election season is behind us uh, now. Um, and uh, I have to tell you that I think that they, I haven't seen more European ambassadors here in this country know more names of counties and cities in different <laughs> states than, than, uh, than, than I have this time. Uh, but COVID season is still uh, with us. Um, what, uh, what's happening in, in Colorado and in, and in the rest of the Mountain West now with the second wave? Is this something that is, uh, is hitting again? And, uh, and how are you trying to deal with it? Well, first of all, thank you, Ambassador uh, Lambradinis, for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to see the attention from Europe to the Mountain West. We, we share so much uh, uh, in, in so many areas. We are so excited to be a world-class destination for European tourists in our world-class ski areas. Uh, the trade relationship in our region. We are uh, really outward looking, the ongoing growth and dynamism, and it makes us a really good partner for the EU as we navigate this. We are 
in Colorado dealing with the same uh, COVID uh, type of situation that many European countries are dealing with, and almost all of our country is dealing with a, a significant, large resurgence in the deadly virus. Um, we have, uh, like European nations, had to balance our response uh, to take into account the need for people to support themselves and our economy, uh, and of course, save lives. We have suffered here, unlike in most European countries, from the lack of a coordinated federal response, uh, which is still elusive. We had one round of economic help, we're very grateful for that, but there needs to be additional work at the national level around the economy and around the health side of this. You effectively have here uh, 50 different responses in 50 different states. Uh, and you know we are all so interconnected, it makes it very difficult to pull that off. And I think that's one of the reasons that America uh, has a higher you know, per capita infection rate than, than almost anywhere else in the world. Well, and certainly in Europe, we, had, uh, we, we made the same mistakes, I would say, at the beginning. Sure. We were working quite in an uncoordinated way, and then we realized very quickly that it wasn't going to work. So whether it came to uh, trying to procure from the world markets uh, PPE equipment that was so necessary, or ventilators, stuff like that, or uh, anything else, uh, we very quickly came together, the EU 27 member states, and we made those procurements jointly. And we ensured that then we could get things fast and at low prices and distribute to all our members uh, and not allow them to just be out there in the world market competing against each other, I have to say. Now, when it comes to the economic consequences that, uh, that you mentioned, as you're trying to come out of COVID, um, what are the biggest challenges? What, what are the areas in which you feel that you can most fruitfully really boost the the, uh, the Mountain West and the Colorado economies? Well, certainly we um, are a world-class destination for tourists from around the world, many of whom can't even come here right now, can't even come to America because there's a travel ban in our country, um, which is uh, ironic or perhaps poetic justice in some sense of the word. But um, we are very cosmopolitan. We look forward to welcoming our friends and neighbors from across the world as soon as we can and as soon as it's safe. Uh, that's one area that uh, tourism, recreation, outdoors, skiing, summer tourism, whitewater river rafting, et cetera. Uh, I think reestablishing uh, international supply chains that have uh, suffered from this uh, crisis as well is going to be very important. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to working with our European partners and others to do that. Thank you. And, and indeed, that, that is precisely the, the reason we decided it was so important to have this meeting today, because this is the emphasis. We, um, uh, we often look at, uh, at the transatlantic economic relationship, and it is the strongest in the world by far, the biggest economic artery. The, uh, uh, we invest uh, about 2 trillion uh, euros in the U.S., uh, creating close to 3 million jobs every year. And then, of course, the trade that comes from the U.S. and the, and the, uh, and the Mountain West to Europe uh, is a huge uh, employment uh, booster for American workers and vice versa. Millions of Europeans have their jobs because of the U.S. investment. So uh, when you look at how this plays out in the Mountain West, in Colorado, there are about 100,000 jobs created uh, just by U EU investment alone. Um, what role do you see um, in this effort to recover from COVID, uh, from that transatlantic cooperation? Um, uh, what kind of investment would you most look forward to, for example, uh, at this stage? Uh, is there any way to make tourism virtual? I guess that's one of the toughest things to do. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, but uh, how, do, how do you manage until uh, borders open uh, to keep the remarkable beauty of the Mountain West at the forefront of people's minds around the world? Well, uh, we certainly are engaging in these kinds of virtual dialogues, and that's very important um, before we can resume in-person trade missions and uh, international trade shows and uh, all of those other normal ways that we, we interact. And I, I'd like to think that there's some uh, glasses half full. There is some benefit to this new way of doing things, meaning we will resume those ways. But I think we will also now uh, are much more familiar with reaching out through Zoom and conferences and we'll be able to augment uh, the normal in-person way of doing business with additional opportunities through the tough lessons of the pandemic. And of course, we have the, the, the positive agenda, all the great things that come with, with great uh, EU-US trade uh, and investment. We also have the, the negative agenda, the tariffs that we've seen uh, sometimes uh, uh, hit us in the past few years, the countermeasures imposed by the EU. Uh, how do the citizens of the Mountain West, uh, of Colorado, of the other states, uh, uh, look at this um, situation? Do, 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 do have tariffs helped or hurt employment and growth? 
uh, in the region? Uh, I, I think they've heard. Uh, they've certainly heard our, our farmers and ranchers. Uh, I think they've heard in many key sectors, have heard consumers. Uh, we are, I'm, we're generally, and I'm generally, Colorado, I think, is a, a generally for free trade with Europe and, and would like a free exchange of ideas and goods and culture and services uh, without tariffs expanding into a common market. Uh, that would certainly be a, a goal of mine. Not, not every Coloradan would agree, of course, just like every American. I think we have a much more outward looking uh, administration now in Washington coming in with the Biden administration. No, no, no administration is going to be perfect in that regard. I don't expect that um, he would go as far as I would to say that we should have, you know, free trade with Europe and many other countries. But I do expect he did, you know, support President Obama's uh, trade agenda. Uh, I think we're ready to at least restart a lot of those uh, opening uh, of trade agreements rather than the opposite direction, which is where we had been going under President Trump, uh, which is additional tariffs, more barriers. Well, we, as you can imagine, we certainly share that view because uh, we also see that our trade relationship is remarkably balanced, in fact. Uh, if you look at goods, if you look at services trade, if you look at profits made of investments, uh, we, we are more or less uh, exactly the same. There, there are no dramatic uh, uh, deficits or surpluses on either side. And that's the result, in fact, of trade and investment between the two biggest, op most open free economies in the world where we respect uh, labor standards. Uh, we don't uh, try to compete unfairly with others by cutting them. We, uh, you know, we're not corrupt. Uh, we respect the environment. Um, we don't try to produce cheap products by destroying it. And that brings me to a very important question. Uh, the Mountain West uh, is so well known in Europe and around the world for its uh, amazing nature, but also for its leadership and your leadership, particularly governor, when it comes to uh, uh, trying to protect the climate and trying to ensure that your economy uh, develops uh, also in a greener way, let's say. Um, what have you identified there as the biggest innovation potentials um, and, and the ones that uh, both for your state but also uh, for the EU-US relationship might, uh, might be fruitful uh, avenues for future uh, investment and trade? Thank you, Ambassador. This is another area where I believe America is back. We're back at the table and, and uh, we'll be rejoining the Paris Accords, but that's just a start. Uh, we are, are, are really, as a nation, going to be back at the table. But I don't want anybody to think that in the absence of our nation leading, many states were not leading because we were, as were many states, uh, uh, in fact, the majority of states have really stronger and aggressive climate plans. We our goal here is 100% renewable energy by 2040, uh, cleaner air quality, doing our part on climate, creating good green jobs of the future, savings for consumers. Uh, our major utilities are already locked in with their plans to be 80% uh, carbon free by uh, within 10 years, by 2030. So we are, we are moving very fast in this regard. Colorado is looked at as a regional and national leader. We are the home of the National Renewable Energies Laboratory. Uh, groundbreaking research being done, including with uh, peer partner institutions in Europe that work on the academic collaboration side with institutions like University of Colorado and Colorado State University. Uh, and when it comes to big economic relationship, um, uh, the, the, the big elephant in the room has always been China. It's China that is changing, uh, that is um, I often tend to say that in, in our containers, when, our, when we put our goods in, we also, uh, we also export our values. Um, we do export in Europe and the U.S. Uh, labor rights and environmental rights, and now other players in the world as well export their own values in their own containers, and they're not values that are particularly uh, respective of, of all those things or of uh, democracy for that matter. Uh, but uh, China is a major trading partner for many European countries and, and many uh, U.S. states, uh, even though uh, a much smaller one than the EU. Uh, what is the presence of the economic presence of China in the Mountain West? How, how do your voters look at the relationship with China uh, and, uh, and the importance of uh, making it more fair? Uh, first, by the way, on the sustainability and environmental front, this is uh, Colorado Recycles Week. We're highlighting our state's commitment to recycling and reuse. That's also a climate issue, reducing carbon emissions. We're developing end markets for recycled products. Uh, yet another area where we uh, hope that Colorado is seen as a national and international leader. We have a long way to go to catch up with where many European nations are in that regard. Not all, but some. Um, China is a more complex relationship. I think when we talk about the European relationship, we don't have any of the geopolitical complexities that exist with uh, 
uh, with, for instance, the U.S. relationship with China. Uh, that being said, uh, we can work through those geopolitical uh, challenges because China is an important economic partner and trading partner. They, they know that. They, they rely on us just like we rely on them. Uh, we also have a strong economic relationship with uh, the people in the, uh, of Taiwan, uh, uh, of Hong Kong, um, of other areas. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's navigating the economic piece. We um, obviously will, um, you know, uh, while we have some, there's some geopolitical alignment, for instance, it seems like a dated term, but you remember the war, war, on, war on terror. Uh, I think we at least have, you know, cooperation against uh, terrorists from, from our major um, uh, trading partners. There's also political, geopolitical difficulties like in the Formosa Straits and other areas, but uh, we, we certainly support a strong economic relationship with China. Yeah, and we see, I mean, we see in Europe as well, uh, like you, a, a relationship that, uh, that uh, can and should be contentious uh, when it comes to values. Uh, or when it comes to unfair uh, trade practices or competition, but also one that needs to cooperate with China when it comes to addressing the major issue of climate change, for example. Um, uh, China is the bigger emitter right now. We need to, uh, to, to, to be able to find a balance. So absolutely. Governor, uh, I know our time has run out, um, and I know your time is uh, uh, supremely valuable. Um, it is such an honor to have had you here with us. Um, this is supposed to be a fire chat discussion. There's no fire around. There, there was good chatting, I suppose. But next time, up close. I very much look forward to visiting you in person uh, and to bringing all the uh, all the good um, uh, vibes and all the good uh, sort of benefits of the relationship with Colorado and the Mountain West. Until then, uh, I would love to also host you back in Europe uh, in any which way with the big um, um, uh, congregation of companies who want to visit us when conditions allow. Uh, this is going to be the best thing that we can do until then, the virtual thing. So um, really great to have you um, and uh, and all the best. Thank you. And I, I believe that our nonstop flights to Europe have just restarted. I think Denver, Frank Frankfurt is back online. We're grateful. Uh, I don't know yet if our uh, other flights are back online, but we were prior to this ambassador adding more direct flights to Europe, Rome, Dublin, we're, 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 we're imminent. Um, and I think we'll get back to that where uh, at least people can get back and forth to Frankfurt, München, London, Rome, Dublin, uh, and many, hopefully many others as well. We, we'd love to add some more and, and we'd love to really increase that interpersonal aspect of the relationship. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So would we, so would we. Very soon, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me on my side now just uh, pass the baton to uh, Thomas Bird, who opened uh, this uh, this event, our uh, wonderful head of the uh, trade section at the EU Embassy. Uh, and a big uh, goodbye from me and, uh, and great success uh, uh, in this event today. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Lambertides, for joining us uh, this morning and for that interesting discussion that really set the scene for what we're about to do now, which is a more, a more sort of specific discussion with um, uh, great colleagues from the four states that are represented today before we take it up to, to a, a bigger discussion with our audience. Uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions in the Q&A um, function of, of this uh, application. So look at the bottom of your screen for any questions you may want to raise. And for the networking, I will be giving you later uh, a reminder on how to link to the conversations starter that you will also be finding in that same uh, chat window of uh, the Zoom application. So we're going to discuss uh, with four colleagues uh, a bit more what, what was just mentioned by the ambassador and by the, uh, the governor. Um, I would like to briefly introduce our, our wonderful panel, and then I'll take uh, questions from, from, from each of them, and we'll uh, turn that into a bigger uh, discussion. We'll start again in Colorado, and we'll start with um, Karen Gerwitz. Uh, Karen is the president of the World Trade Center in Denver that we were very happy to visit uh, last year when traveling was uh, still a thing. We were there with a number of European Union uh, member states and the EU delegation, and uh, had a wonderful time in, in Denver meeting a number of, of partners. Karen has a lot of experience in international business, uh, both in private, public, as well as the non-profit sectors. And uh, she has been working on uh, business development and strategic growth and in marketing, not only in Colorado or in, in many different sectors, but also abroad in Ghana and in Austria, uh, Europe. Next, we'll go to Utah, where we will hear from David Karlbach, who is the Vice President of the International Investment at the World Trade Center uh, in Utah. 
David is responsible for increasing the amount of international capital flows to the state of Utah, which I guess is something he, he also worked on while he was at Goldman Sachs, where he had a long career, including as a managing uh, director. I won't be testing David today, but I understand he's also fluent in German, and that might be useful for our networking event later. Kevin Oshie is joining us from Arizona, where he's the Senior Vice President for International Trade at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Kevin manages and delivers a suite of export assistance programs for Arizona companies. And I think that will be very interesting for us to hear how, how that is working in, in very practical terms. Kevin has over 30 years of experience also in the international trade arena, including as a lawyer in San Francisco, from where I understand he was imported into Arizona. Last but not very least, we will be hearing from Cabinet Secretary Alicia Keys in New Mexico. Alicia was appointed Cabinet Secretary um, by the governor of um, uh, uh, New Mexico in 2019. She grew up, she studied in Albuquerque, but started her career in the film industry where she worked uh, uh, in global acquisitions for Walt Disney Company. She later returned to New Mexico and started her own company, specializing in creating independent content for films. So she knows a thing or two about uh, owning and running a business herself. And if that is not exciting enough, uh, Alicia is also uh, responsible as cabinet secretary for the New Mexico Spaceport Authority, as well as the New Mexico Film Office and the Division for Outdoor Recreation. But we'll start uh, in Colorado again, Karen. Uh, we already heard a little bit about the trade tensions that we've been talking about, the tariffs that we uh, hear a lot about. What do the tariffs mean from, from your perspective? We heard from the governor that they, they hurt more than they help. Uh, but can you give us a little bit more detail on how this uh, is seen from, from Colorado's perspective and from Denver? Yes, Thomas, thanks, thanks so much for, again for having me as part of the panel and uh, bringing this program to the Mountain West. It's important to uh, present with my colleagues here from across uh, these various states. Um, I'm not sure we'd be all, totally universal on this, but I, I agree with the governor uh, that tariffs really rarely help business. Um, on either front, um, retaliation almost always occurs. And so it's not only harming on the import side, but also on when we try to export goods. And um, ultimately they make our companies less competitive and the prices go up for consumers. So to be honest, I know that they are temporary measures, but um, they don't necessarily um, help situations, especially with allies. And in and, and Europe, we have a strong, strong trade relationship and um, while we're you know, going back and forth with the tariff um, retaliation on a number of different fronts right now, it um, doesn't bode well for long-standing relations. And so I would like to see these tariffs be removed and also um, uh, find ways that we can uh, collaborate and grow, um, maybe even come into a free trade agreement uh, between the United States and, and, and the EU. I'd like to see us um, take the higher road and, and find ways that we can collaborate and, and grow both markets. So um, especially, you know, we have in, in the rural areas of our states, I think companies are, are harmed even more than urban areas because urban areas, you have more services and um, the, the rural areas are doing some manufacturing, a um, lot of agriculture. And so a um, lot of issues um, coming about uh, in our rural areas and each state uh, in the Mountain West has concerns there. Um, I think also the uncertainty of whether we're going to have tariffs one day and then we're not the next. Um, you cannot plan for anything if the, if the game changes every week. And so it's um, really difficult for us to, for companies to, to plan long-term, uh, set pricing, uh, set up distribution, et cetera. So it's um, the supply chains are affected uh, because of tariffs and um, I'd like to see us change that. Um, perhaps in, in, a, in a new administration, we can. Um, I don't think it'll be immediate, but I think um, it is something that we should try to strive for. Well, that's a very clear um, message, Karen. Thank you. But is that a message that you also are able to communicate, to, let's say, to the average American? Uh, is this about saying that tariffs are taxes? There's a lot of confusion out there. And when you use words like supply chain, I, I guess you lose, you lose some of the broader audience that you have. What, what can you do? What have you done to, to communicate better with the average American on this? Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question. A lot of consumers do feel that um, 
that they're not impacted. And uh, I can absolutely say that is not true. So, um, you know, prices are when they are when when imports rise, the prices rise, then uh, those those often get passed on to consumers. Sometimes companies will absorb some of those costs, but for the most part, they are passed on to consumers. So prices of goods are going up. Um, because tariff is usually a, a relatively small percentage, it may not be as evident uh, for consumers on individual products, but as a whole, you're gonna feel that your economies are, or your at least your personal power, your personal wealth is, is going to be squeezed because of tariffs. So um, we, are, we put on a number of events here and uh, try to involve the public wherever we can. So we are uh, often trying to uh, explain the harms of tariffs and we take a bold approach of that. Colorado and the World Trade Center Denver um, really are more for free trade and, and trying to um, see if we can get our products uh, exported effectively, um, limit, limit um, tariffs on imports as well. So uh, I think we do our best to, to send a clear message on a regular basis. That's great. Well, we, we have seen some of the bumper stickers already here in Washington. <laughs> about how parents are Texas, so that might be one idea to, to communicate more and, and yes. in simpler terms, perhaps, with average Americans. All right, thank you, Karen. Over to, to Utah, David. Um, we, we hear a lot about the challenges of trade, um, but there's also a lot of opportunity there, including in the form of investment. Since you are so, with, with all your experience in attracting investment and, and capital flows, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how the land is looking? What are the challenges and opportunities in attracting uh, foreign direct investment from, from Salt Lake City? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. And again, as Karen said, I really appreciate the uh, EU delegation for organizing this event. And it's great that you did it on a Mountain West wide basis. It's, it's really nice to put faces to states and uh, to see some of my colleagues here on the call. Um, in terms of uh, foreign investment, uh, maybe just start with uh, the importance of it. Uh, I think it's very important to the US overall. Um, there are roughly um, uh, anywhere from uh, uh, four and a half to eight percent of employment in the U.S. is tied to companies that are owned uh, internationally, and a lot of that, most of that, to be honest, is is from Europe. Um, and in Utah, it's it's similar. We have roughly fifty per, uh, fifty thousand uh, jobs in Utah tied to foreign investment. That's roughly three percent of our workforce, so less than the national average and kind of points to the importance to us as a state of promoting it more. Um, my job in particular, you said I have a lot of experience with attracting foreign investment. Actually, I've been in this role on the nonprofit side for only a year and a half or so. It was a job that was created, a role that was created uh, by the governor uh, and, and the legislature here in Utah, specifically to focus on attracting more foreign investment. Uh, so I think that speaks to the importance of it in the, in the state's agenda uh, and, and in terms of what the opportunity is, broadly speaking. Um, in terms of uh, what uh, Utah sees in foreign investment, um, as I, I gave you a sense of the size, many of the leading uh, investors are European countries. Um, uh, the uh, countries from which we kind of underperform relative to national average uh, is Ireland and Japan. Uh, so there's an opportunity there, specifically within the EU with, with Ireland. Uh, and countries where we overperform uh, on a relative basis are Sweden and Switzerland. Uh, in terms of what we're looking for, it's a pretty broad range. We're, we're taking kind of an all of the above approach. Um, I think a lot of times when people talk about foreign investment, they're thinking primarily of greenfield uh, establishments or expansion. Uh, but in fact, in the FDI numbers, those are relatively small, uh, at least in the numbers I see, compared to acquisitions. Uh, so those are all types of uh, investment that we want, establishments, expansions, acquisitions. But we're also interested in financial investors, in funds, in startups. We're looking for small uh, and startup companies to come here and grow and seeing Utah as an entry point into the US. Uh, and we would also like to see more investment in uh, public uh, infrastructure projects. I know this has been the goal for the US and many states in the US for years, if not decades, uh, but we, we are a 
very fast growing state and we are gonna need infrastructure to keep up. Uh, and so we're keen to see if we can first uh, coin some more projects that are uh, have that uh, private participation element to them, uh, some uh, infrastructure projects that have that element to them, and then try to market those and get more uh, focus on that from institutional investors abroad. Thank you, David. Can I, can I ask, since we're in, in, in Washington here and we obviously talk a lot about politics, um, but, but do you see a change in the political landscape following the last election in terms of how that will redefine perhaps the, the relationships that, that the states will have and, and Utah will have also with, with countries abroad? Or will it be more business as usual? Will you, will you be uh, sort of keep, keeping the I, I I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I don't really want to speculate based on changing of parties. I do think in terms of events that have occurred or um, you know, changes in, in the broader mindset. I, I do think the risks that were exposed due to the pandemic of having a low resiliency, at least for critical uh, products like, like uh, you know, drugs and, and PPE and so forth, and the uh, uh, response from the Trump administration, or at least the statement from the Trump administration that we want to uh, push for more resiliency uh, in those critical areas, uh, I, I think that's a, a bipartisan issue, if you will. I think it's a global issue as well. I don't think any country wants to have um, exposure on, on critical products. Uh, and, and so I think um, the, you know, the next shoe, whether it's the Trump administration or the Biden administration, I, th I think uh, it, it's still too early to tell how that plays out. I, I, my sense is it won't be uh, quick. And it might not be specifically all back onshore from a national perspective, more of a nearshore approach, obviously with USMCA, our ability to, to bring more nearshore, say in, in Mexico, uh, seems like a saddle point that maybe is where it all settles out in the end. That's great, David. We'll, we'll come back to you. you. You mentioned a number of very interesting points there, but I do want to go to Arizona next and, and, and hear from Kevin a little bit from the experience he has with export assistance. Uh, what are the export challenges or the challenges that exporters have in, in, uh, in making the jump perhaps to, to exporting and how you can help uh, and how that has been going over the last few years? Kevin? Sure, sure. Thank you very much for having me. And um, before, I, before I respond to that question, let me give you a, a sense of some things that have transpired since um, I was recently invited to participate in this event. Coincidence? Perhaps not. Um, gives you a flavor of some of the things that are happening in Arizona vis-a-vis um, -vis our relationship with, um, with the EU. A couple of weeks ago, I uh, uh, visited the near complete building of um, nearly completed building of, a, of an aerospace company in Mesa uh, that is, uh, will be the US headquarters for a, for a company from the Netherlands. It's an aerospace company uh, that is uh, uh, committed to Arizona about a year ago. Uh, last week, we had the uh, visit of the U.S. ambassador to Austria, along with the leadership team of, um, of a company we're all familiar with called Red Bull. Um, and Red Bull has um, uh, 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 begun operations in, uh, in a city in the West Valley here in the greater Phoenix area called Glendale. Um, and um, even more recently, um, one, of the, one of the many SMEs that I work with on the export side um, is a rural company, uh, and it, uh, it manufactures an autonomous water rescue vehicle. And they have, uh, they've just reported to me that they are now selling into 13 EU countries, which is, which is nearly 50% of the 27, of the 27 EU members. Um, the EU is an important, um, is an important market for us. Uh, it is, uh, in terms of uh, a trade partner, it's, um, it's about 17% of our trade, export and, and imports. Um, and that's a, a fairly balanced trade, um, as the ambassador um, suggested in his opening comments. Uh, about 18% of our exports go to, the, go to the EU, and about 15% of our imports come from the EU. Um, our top um, EU export markets last year um, the top five were Netherlands, Germany, France, Ireland, Switzerland. Um, all five of those countries are among um, our 
25 largest export destinations with um, three of those being in the top 10, uh, the Netherlands, Germany, and France. Um, one of the reasons that um, that small company that I mentioned to you is having so much export success is, um, is because here in Arizona, like, um, like my colleagues in, 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 in Utah and Colorado and New Mexico, um, we, we, we deliver programming that enables companies to, to actually go into market. Um, uh, we, we bring companies to trade shows, we bring companies on targeted B2B and B2G trade missions. Um, that, that small rural, um, now highly successful exporter um, participated in a number of, of trade shows with us. Um, uh, some of those within the EU, um, some of those outside the EU, but all of, in all of those shows, um, they had the opportunity to meet with potential buyers and uh, potential sales channel partners um, from, from EU member nations. You mentioned trade shows, uh, Gavin. I mean, can you maybe say a, a brief word about how you are facilitating those types of interactions in, in times of a global pandemic uh, that trade shows and travel is not really happening? Yes, uh, many of us have, have, been, um, have been pivoting to a more virtual mode. Um, what we're doing for our companies um, as we await the reopening of, of live, show, live shows is identifying um, virtual uh, B2B, B2B meeting uh, events. Um, we have um, found those to be, um, frankly, um, a mixed bag. Um, uh, and some, some, some are quite well orchestrated. Um, we've done a number of those, um, uh, including in, uh, in Mexico, uh, in Israel, where we, have, uh, where we have our trade offices. Um, we're looking to participate uh, in an aerospace um, B2B, virtual B2B in France. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, finding, we're finding those events are um, by and large um, well run, um, but we're also, and we're also finding that our companies uh, have a um, uh, insatiable hunger for them. Um, some may find it surprising, but I have not been busier. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, than I have, post COVID. Um, and, and that is because um, many of our companies, particularly SMEs um, are realizing that one of their key strategies for recovery needs to be um, expanding their markets. And, um, you know, not just selling in, in, in our state, in our region, in our country, um, but, um, but internationally as well with, and, and, and that includes the EU. So um, I'm working with a lot of companies to help them develop um, targeted export plans. Again, many of those focusing on, uh, on the EU. So I'm seeing a lot of companies making very good utilization of some of the time that they have right now um, to be looking into other markets. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin. Let's go to, uh, to New Mexico. And, and I would like to hear from Alicia how she's working to broaden New Mexico's uh, export base and, and what markets you're primarily interested in and perhaps what programs, what assistance are you offering from New Mexico to, to have more exports, more trade between New Mexico and other places, including, of course, the European Union? Alicia. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Um, and uh, before we all got on here, uh, the ambassador realized I wasn't the singer and got very upset. So I'm, I'm hoping that people that are tuning in are not tuning in thinking that they're here for Alicia Keys, the singer. This is um, so. In terms of um, what we've seen recently, and I think that this is in strong part due to a trip that we took right before COVID. Um, I went over with my counterpart, Alejandro de la Vega from Chihuahua, Mexico over to Asia, um, particularly to Taiwan. And um, with the idea of doing binational agreements with companies that wanted to move their manufacturing out of China, particularly, and into the border region. So we've seen quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of companies uh, relocate now to New Mexico and Chihuahua, putting a lot of their heavier industry into Mexico, and then doing their um, assembly and headquarters in New Mexico. So I think we're gonna see that trend continue. 
What I think that the border, um, the New Mexico Mexico border, is um, our biggest asset, and this administration is highly focused on that global trade. Um, in terms of the resources that we have, our office does utilize the SBA grant um, in addition to the Gold Key Service Program um, quite extensively. Um, we did have somebody that was working in New Mexico for 25 years in global trade, and he recently resigned. So we are looking at really the, um, how we can better structure our office to respond to the market. Um, we're also tracking quite a bit of legislation in DC with regards to onshoring and reshoring and having conversations. Uh, we have a seminar, a virtual seminar with our governor and the um, Consul General of India coming up. So um, I'm going to echo what Kevin said. We've never been busier. And um, it might be because people are just reevaluating how they do business. It might be because New Mexico seems to be a better alternative than some of the bigger, more crowded cities. Um, it could be our incentives that we offer. It could be a whole host of things. Um, but we are definitely seeing an uptick in terms of global trade. Thank you very much, uh, Alicia. And after this first round of questions, I, I want to actually um, ask a question to each one of you. And I'll start with you, Alicia. Um, I'm putting you all on a plane to Washington now, and you are going to meet with some of the new officials uh, that we expect to, to see soon. Uh, what will be your sort of executive brief on, on, on your perspective, on your issues that you would like to see resolved in Washington, thinking in terms of trade, global integration, and sort of the state of the economy? That is a really fantastic question. I think that um, echoing what Karen said earlier is um, that the tariffs have really hurt specifically our rural farmers. Um, we have pecan farmers in the south of New Mexico, and it's uh, one of our largest exports. Um, so I feel like if we can focus on uh, what we're going to do next in order to help those rural farmers, um, agriculture, definitely for New Mexico. I think that um, this administration hasn't necessarily helped global trade. So really just opening up again, having those conversations, diplomacy. What we find is, you know, when we travel, when we travel with the governor, when we do trips, when we make those one-on-one -on -one, um, connections with companies in Europe or in Asia, that makes all the difference in the world. So really, how do we open up um, those lines of communication more than they have been in the past few years? very much. Uh, Kevin, can I ask you the same question? What would you be your executive brief from Arizona? Sure. Um, when I when I travel the world with, um, with Arizona companies, particularly SMEs, it's probably not of much surprise to you, Tomas, that, um, that their counterparts in the EU are, uh, are counterparts that they envy. Um, the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises in Europe um, are the beneficiaries of considerable attention, con considerable economic uh, support, um, export assistance support from their, from their, from their governments. Um, uh, I, I think, I think um, we would like to see um, that mirrored on the US side. Um, one great stride in that is a program that Alicia mentioned, which is the uh, SBA's State Trade Expansion Program, which is an export assistance program for small businesses. Um, that is a great that is a great step in the right direction. Um, no pun intended. Um, also, um, uh, we, our, our our export import bank in the U.S. Um, is um, frequently under siege, um, and that is a uh, that is an entity that is highly valued by exporters uh, in our in our in our country, um, small, medium sized, and large large companies. So. Uh, we would hope to see that um, the the Exim Bank here, um, like you have uh, uh, many such entities in the EU, uh, continues to to be of assistance to to Arizona companies. Thank you, David, and then Karen, your brief to the Biden team. 
Uh, thank you, and thank you for taking me third and giving me a little time to collect my thoughts. <laughs> um, it's an interesting, provocative question. I guess I would answer in terms of three areas. Uh, one, going back to what we spoke about earlier, I mentioned earlier on reshoring and nearshoring. I think it would be great if they were clear and relatively quickly clear about what the incentives, penalties, support uh, there will be for that, if, if that is to be a national priority. Uh, I think second within that category would also be to establish a strong coordination function. I think the notion of having resiliency uh, is one, uh, you know, it sounds good, but uh, how any one group, company, state, what have you, can really have an overview of where the where the weak links in the chain are, et cetera, I, th I think is a tall order. And um, I, I think help at the federal level to provide that kind of transparency would really help uh, companies and states focus on, on the weakest links. Uh, second area broadly, I guess would be in the, in, uh, around related to Select USA. I think it is the federal government's premier program for attracting investment and, um, I think two things I'd suggest is make it more virtual. Um, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it had a culture and, and history around big, massive events, but we, we've uh, had so much success with virtual events, at least for qualifying leads. Uh, we've worked very productively with the US Commercial Service, uh, basically the Select USA team kind of sort of, uh, with uh, single uh, location promotions virtually. Uh, and they've been very low effort on our sides with relatively good returns. I think more in that direction would be welcome. I would also say for them that they uh, in Select USA should continue uh, to focus on expanding the scope of the type of investment they're attracting. I alluded to this earlier when I said it's you know generally economic development when it comes to investment focuses on relocations. I would love to see them continue to work on uh, growing their programs for uh, SMEs and for startups and, and to attract more institutional investors, frankly, uh, into the discussion around investment opportunities uh, in the US. And then the third broad category, uh, just building off of what Kevin said, STEP uh, made me think, um, we do very well with the STEP program uh, and we use it uh, because we use it effectively. It's, it's, it's the funding for us has grown and it's a great asset for us to take to the companies here in Utah, but it is focused on trade. And uh, being an investment guy, um, I, I wish there was even more flexibility in how we could use those funds um, to do analogous, make an analogous uh, grants to help with uh, driving more investment. Thank you, very good points, uh, David. Karen. Yes, I would, I would say that while the US uh, has engaged in a tariff war with our allies, China has moved ahead with the largest free trade agreement in the world. And um, I feel like it's distracting uh, to us. Um, I would absolutely um, ask that the Biden administration take their power of the executive branch to make some changes within trade as the Trump administration has done. Um, take some of that um, control back, maybe head us in, into a more proactive, um, collaborative uh, trade relationship with our allies, especially uh, Europe being at the top. So how can we um, further ties between our two markets and boost our economies, especially because of COVID and the subsequent recession? We need to think of uh, more ways to boost our economy, not to hinder it. Um, and I think the tariffs have hindered uh, our economy greatly. So um, yeah, those are the things I would start with for sure. I think there's many other things um, that I would bring up to the table. I like what my colleagues have, have already suggested. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see where, where, where things go. I think we can do a lot more uh, together. Great, I, I think I just collected a great number of talking points that we also want to use in our conversations with the, with the new team. Thank you for those uh, thoughts. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about, about borders. When we speak about trade, we inevitably focus on barriers and on borders. And Europe is built on an internal market that, that removes those borders between the member states that we have. As a European coming to the United States, it's, it's often interesting to see how there are indeed 50 distinct uh, states. And I think this pandemic is perhaps a reminder of, of how, how there are perhaps borders in the United States. 
Um, between the four of you, uh, what is the role of borders? Are, are you competing? Are you cooperating? Um, we heard a lot about nearshoring already and supply chains. Uh, how, how much integration is there between the four of you? And do you work uh, with synergies between you in, in terms of your export promotion activities and your investment uh, promotion activities? I don't want to single out anyone, but whoever wants to go first, uh, I'll be happy to hear your thoughts. I mean, I can, I, I can start, I'm going to mention Karen, so maybe you're about to say the same thing, but certainly as colleagues in the World Trade Center Association, which is a global association of over 300 members, uh, often for a city or for a state or, um, uh, yeah, cities and states, um, we work together quite a bit. I think we all, as members, try to share best practices. Karen certainly has been very generous in sharing uh, experiences and ideas with our team, especially around trade and, and developing our trade promotion programs. Um, and um, I mean, that's that's very concrete. I, I would say generally, I don't think we, I, I certainly don't think of each state as competitors. I mean, it's a big world out there. The inner mountain west region is, is relatively small. I think we all have lots of opportunities to, if you will, gain share. Uh, and so, um, I, I, I don't think of borders, certainly borders between uh, intermountain states or, or states in general to be uh, a significant factor in the way we approach doing business. Tomas? Yes. Um, here in Arizona, we border um, two of the largest economies in the world, California and, um, and Mexico. And that is, um, that is no small appeal. Um, um, to, uh, to an Arizona investor um, uh, that is looking at um, accessing both of those markets. Um, and so we see a lot of investment coming to Arizona, recognizing um, the benefits of a large market, consum consumer market in California, and also recognizing um, a large consumer market um, and ever increasing consumer market in Mexico. Um, we had an electric vehicle company that uh, that has broken ground in central Arizona come to Arizona um, for many reasons, but uh, a, a very significant reason was was our relationship with Mexico, um, that, which is very productive, very positive, um, puts us in uh, proximity to a great number of um, automotive suppliers, uh, just about three hours south of the Arizona Sonora border. Uh, we have three trade offices, three trade teams in Mexico. Um, so um, uh, we, um, we 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 take advantage of um, of of of, uh, of our neighbor um, relationships, um, and um, it's uh, I think we we see it as beneficial on a, on a mutual basis. Sure. Um, and I really quickly spoke about it earlier, but um, we have formal relationships with Sonora and Chihuahua and meet with them extensively throughout the year. Um, and uh, we really see it as collaborative and um, cooperation. And um, when you go down to our border in New Mexico and Mexico, you will see that families live on both sides. They work on both sides. There are friends, there are neighbors. So our approach, at least for this administration, is to be very collaborative and to see what we can put together where companies can be on both sides of the border and um, get the opportunity that each of those countries provides. And I would just say that uh, the connectivity of your supply chain is becoming even more, more uh, important to uh, to us as economies than political boundaries. So um, finding ways to trade across borders and engage, um, engage other countries, uh, hopefully we'll be able to adopt some of our immigration policies uh, to, to address some of the issues that uh, we've, we've seen this year, so. Thank you uh, to all for your questions. We, we already heard a little bit about, uh, what, about the Mexican border and, and about Mexico as well as about the US MCA, the US uh, Canada Mexico agreement. Um, what are the expectations or what's the mood in terms of the, the solutions that the US MCA may bring or, or the implementation challenges that we now see? Are, are you picking this up uh, from, from your contacts with companies uh, on the ground? And I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, if I should look at the, 
the, the, the most southern states first, Kevin and Alicia. Any thoughts on USMCA implementation? Or is this not yet on your radar? Is this not yet an issue for the companies? Uh, in Arizona, Mexico is on our is on our radar twenty four seven. It's our it's our largest uh, trade partner by far, um, and again, uh, a, a large shared border. Um, like uh, Alicia said, with New Mexico, we have um, long standing uh, familial relationships. Um, uh, uh, Mexican citizens are um, significant consumers um, that uh, of Arizona goods and services. Um, we have trade offices in Mexico City, Guanajuato and Chihuahua. And I would say that um, even during the uncertainty preceding um, the closure or the uh, completion of the USMCA, um, Arizona businesses were finding ways to push forward even with the uncertainty because um, you know these are companies that, that see that see Mexico as a as a significant market, um, particularly in um, in some um, uh, uh, shared shared industries, shared key in industries such as um, aerospace, medical technology, um, uh, automotive. Um, so it's it's a it's a country that is on our daily radar, and um, what wh whatever complexities are brought to us um, from um, national capitals, we find a way to. Uh, to persevere. Alicia, anything to add from New Mexico? I haven't been involved in the direct policy on the USMCA, so I'd probably defer to someone like Karen on this question. I haven't seen it as um, an overwhelming issue for companies yet. But Karen, what is your what are your what are your what's your feedback? Well, I, some industries have really gained. Uh, the dairy industry, for instance, uh, is able to sell more into Canada. Uh, now, it's not completely solved, but it's certainly gotten better. I think for the general um, corporate interaction between the um, North American region, the, uh, some of the paperwork has gotten a little bit easier. Um, intellectual property rights have gotten a little stronger because of the USMCA. Um, the automotive industry is probably the most significant change um, within, within the USMCA. They're... Um, They've raised the wage rates. They've changed the uh, content of the um, origin of content um, quite substantially, uh, requiring a lot more of the origin of the car to be made in the North American agreement, so or North American region. So I think it's pluses and minuses um, for certain industries. Uh, so it's uh, it's definitely. I'm. I think the thing that we're all grateful for is that there was no harm done. <laughs> um, we were worried that uh, that maybe this might have been unraveled, and um, and that would have been incredibly harmful uh, for for trade in in this region. I only hope that we can um, find ways to come up with an agreement with the EU uh, to strengthen ties there, though. Yeah, so we will certainly try our, our best in making sure that we stay the the first partner of the United States and. I, I wanted to point out that 47 states of, of the U.S. trade more with the European Union than they trade with China, for example. Uh, and Mexico is another important uh, partner we, we, we know. But can I maybe spend a minute on China and ask you what you see on the ground and, and in your state in terms of Chinese presence and Chinese investment? Are you seeing the China effect uh, in your state or, or, or aren't you seeing this yet? Um, I, I could say a few words on that to start. Um, I think Utah has historically had very strong ties to China. In fact, the deputy minister in the Chinese embassy in the U.S. has commented multiple times, so I believe her, that Utah is their number one subnation, um, subnational kind of partner or uh, group that they have, they feel they have the best relationship with uh, at a state level. Uh, and she's responsible for subnational strategy in China. Um, and, and that, that, hit, that history goes, is, is based on many factors. Um, but with that said, of course, you know, there are concerns about, um, about uh, trade and, and generally relations. And, and so we've gone into that with our eyes wide open, uh, not wanting to be taken advantage of, uh, but, and, but, but realizing that they're, they're, uh, you know, it can be mutually beneficial and, and important for our state. I would say specifically with respect to the, it's round one trade, 
deal with China. Uh, we did see them come here uh, with, with extra focus on finding ways to buy products, especially agricultural products in Utah. Uh, and we certainly tried from our seats to facilitate that. So, so um, I think they were, they were eager to, to live up to their commitments or are eager to live up to their commitments and find opportunities to buy. Uh, and so our, our strong relationship with them led them to come here and make an extra effort to connect. Um, but with that said, I, I think it's, uh, it's always been a complicated relationship and I, I think it's uh, only gotten more complicated and more nuanced and uh, time will tell. Any other uh, reactions on, on China? Uh, just from the manufacturing base, mostly I'll, I'll speak to, um, and you know, the supply chain disruptions have been um, incredibly harmful for the companies that utilize either components or do contract manufacturing there. Um, but China has actually gotten up and running closer or sooner than anybody else. So um, the fact that they are going to be able to um, continue manufacturing at full speed where we may not be at full speed yet. Um, and also now they've entered into this agreement that's only going to enhance manufacturing in, in Asia. I feel like um, there is a there is going to be a surge of manufacturing uh, in Asia, uh, especially China, but also in Vietnam, Malaysia, and other and other countries that are part of the agreement. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe if we can take it to to the green technology and the green sector more generally, that was also raised by uh, the ambassador and, and the governor. Uh, in Europe, we're we're looking to make a, a green transformation uh, to a green economy and and. The green agenda is very much part of our own recovery uh, process. So we're investing a lot of money into green uh, R&D and, and technology. But with that, of course, come some of the challenges, uh, including from China, from Mexico and from other places that are competing with us in the development of some of those uh, technologies. Is there anything, and I'm picking up one of the questions that, that comes from the audience also, is there anything that we can do or that you can do perhaps or think of in terms of protecting uh, that type of uh, R&D and, and industrial development in such important sectors like, uh, like the green economy? Is there anything that we're doing to protect as opposed to to open up uh, this type of trade to the rest of the world? Well, I might start here if I can. Just picking off on what our governor said, you know, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory is here in Colorado and um, we get a lot of international input and sharing of innovation uh, through that laboratory. But it is the sharing of innovation and ideas that is going to catapult us forward in green technology. And so now is an opportunity to, to share digitally, um, look at our um, look at our best our, our best uh, examples around the world to see what we can learn from, and improve all of our um, all of our efforts there. So. Trade, trade doesn't only mean trade of goods, it also means trade of ideas, trade of knowledge, trade of um, technology. And I'd like to see us uh, plug into more, um, you know, comprehensive uh, digital trade around green economy and how we can, how we can improve everybody's, everybody's game in that area. David, I see you're ready to go. Maybe. <laughs> Again, I appreciate the time to collect my thoughts. I, I, I don't know if this is exactly responsive, but it does strike me when you talk about protecting or um, uh, you know, strategies that taking advantage of our natural assets that are embedded in our, in our geology and in our, um, in our, in our uh, geography uh, is one thing, and uh, not just to push Utah, but that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, you know, we have certain assets in this state, such as uh, salt uh, caverns uh, that we're using to store compressed hydrogen, uh, and and we also have geothermal, um, and and we're using these assets to. Um, there's a lot of innovation partnership with Enal, for example, on the geothermal, and we're working very closely with California. Uh, to kind of be their backyard as a source for some clean energy solutions for you know their their needs because you know especially because they have such high standards when it comes to that and and so it's it's just it's probably a small piece of the answer to your question but uh, you know there certainly are 
uh, assets that we have that are embedded in just our, our again our geography and our geology. And I, I think those are ones to, to keep in mind when you think about strategy and, and, and how to how to yeah win in, in, in the future. Great point of the sort of natural competitive or comparative yeah. advantage perhaps that, that each one of us have. Any other thoughts from Kevin or Alicia? I'll chime in here really quickly. Um, our governor and the legislature passed of the Energy Transition Act last year. We've seen a huge uptick in renewables in New Mexico. Um, and I'm watching the comments over here and somebody's talking about the wind blades that are being made in Mexico. And my question always is, how do we get that manufacturing here? And unfortunately, we are not going to ever win in terms of wages because Mexico um, is, is paying uh, so little compared to New Mexico in terms of wages for the manufacturing of this. And so I always think to myself, it's really about the advanced manufacturing, it's about the technology and it's about um, progressing that so that it's not about the minimum wage employee. Um, it's about the technology that's here. So um, in line with what Karen said, it's um, researching, improving the technology, making sure that our um, workers are trained in that technology. Um, and I think that's how we're going to potentially get some of that um, production and manufacturing back in the States. And I feel like that also applies for agriculture. When you look at agriculture, it's just so much cheaper to grow chilies in Mexico than in New Mexico. So what's the future of agriculture um, in the United States? It's technology and it's teaching people how to use that technology. Very good points. And, and of course, points we very much share in, in Europe and we're in the same situation largely. Uh, Alicia, thank you. Kevin. Tomas, when you, um, when you ask about, or the audience asked about um, green technology, I, I don't think of, um, I don't just think of, of green, green energy. I think of um, advanced manufacturing that is producing greener products. Um, and that's what we're seeing a lot of in Arizona. Arizona was never considered um, until very, very recently an automotive state. Um, you know, we don't have any traditional automotive manufacturers here in, 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 in Arizona. That being said, just in the past couple of years, we're now, we're now um, going to be producing um, electric vehicles, uh, electric powered trucks. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a, it, in terms of green, it's a matter of sort of staying ahead of the, of the curve and, and playing to the strengths that uh, uh, US manufacturers have um, and, and maintaining a competitive advantage as, uh, as, 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 as green technology gets more and more sophisticated and appears in um, uh, more and more of our um, consumable products. Great. Very good points indeed, Kevin. Thank you so much. Uh, enough uh, complicated questions. I want to fire off a, a few simple questions and I want also simple answers. So uh, be, be ready for uh, rapid fire questions. Uh, but in the meantime, I can also say that we will have a poll uh, appear in the, in the chat that the members of the audience can fill out uh, if they have a minute to spare just on our conversation. And of course, we still welcome any questions that there may, might be from the audience. Um, on the rapid fire question, and I'll start again in Colorado, Karen, first one's for you. Um, name one problem that you would like to go away and see addressed to make business in your state easier. Don't change the rules of the game so frequently. Let, let things lie for at least a year <laughs> so we can plan. Boring is beautiful, if I can summarize that. <laughs> More stability and predictability. Boring is beautiful. Yes, I like that. How does it, how does it look for Utah? I'm sorry, did you say for Utah? Yes. Um, I guess, I guess uh, first thought that comes to mind is I, I would like uh, uh, foreign uh, companies to think more broadly and be open-minded to uh, a diverse set of states to, to work in. There's such a, a bias and tendency towards, towards working with California or you know the coastal states uh, just to think more about Utah and think about the diversity of, of, uh, of opportunities across the US. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, to David's point, we are 
we are seeing more and more investors who are um, discovering locations other than California and Boston and and New York and Miami and looking for um, for markets that are um, have an abundance of talent. Workforce is so important. Um, uh, cheaper land for both uh, for both um, manufacturing space, but also for workers to buy homes. Um, more rational regulatory environments, um, and I think um, I think states in our region um, uh, benefit from all of those. Alicia. I'm going to kind of take a different tack because um, it's very, you know, New Mexico and Utah and Arizona are so similar. So um, I would say that on, in terms of policy, when you hit a recession, everybody's gut reaction is austerity. And I would say right now is the time to invest in economic development and kind of double down um, because we have an opportunity in the Mountain West. Um, to capture some of this business that's historically gone to the coasts. So I would say just more of an open mind about recruiting companies, incentivizing companies, um, and targeting those industries that your state is best at and really focusing. Great point indeed. I'll, and I'll start with you, Alicia, for a second question, rapid question, quick answer. Which is this, the first European country you will visit after the travel restrictions are lifted? It can be private or professional. Where will you go? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me say I've lived in London, um, I've uh, lived in Spain, I've lived in Paris, um, and so, gosh, um, I think right now it's uh, probably going to be, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, there's 27 options. There's so many options. Um, I'm feeling a need to go back to France right now. Um, and I don't know why, but just like an overwhelming, just need to need to go and touch base. That is a good answer, Kevin. Let's go. <laughs> well, in the, if the COVID cloud lifts, uh, the next trade expo that's on my calendar, um, that would be in the EU, is uh, is in Munich, uh, which would be the laser world of photonics. It's a uh, optics and photonics is a significant. Uh, industry here in Arizona and uh, participated in that show on a prior edition and look forward to bringing Arizona companies back to that event. That is great and I don't know if you've seen in the chat we have Dieter Bollmann from the German American Chamber uh, the Arizona chapter that is also uh, raising their the interest in precisely these issues. David where will you go? I'd probably go to Germany on personal grounds. I, I lived there for three years and um, uh, uh, had a wonderful time. Also with it, of course, being the largest economy in Europe, uh, I could get double duty, both personal satisfaction and, uh, and, and find some uh, opportunities to promote the state and, and uh, do business. Thank you for sharing that, David. Karen? Well, our daughter lives in Berlin, and so I miss her dearly. I'd love to go there. Um, but I'm part Irish, so I have a, a, a fondness for my people there. So I would um, probably go to those places. All right, Germany and France are doing well. We'll, uh, we'll definitely report that. Last, my last question, at least uh, for all of you, which state is your favorite neighbor? And you can only mention one. Hmm. Karen? I'm still oh, don't start with me. Um, <laughs> can I say Wyoming, since none of you are from there? I didn't want to um, pick one of you, so. Um, Wyoming. Wyoming. Sounds, sounds wonderful. David, is there any? Yeah, she stole my line. I, I was thinking of uh, a state that's not represented here, but Wyoming is a wonderful state. Uh, and uh, Jackson Hole is uh, a place we've gone to a few times. So uh, uh, that or in Idaho, we were recently in Sun Valley. So there are lots of beautiful, we're blessed here in the West with so many beautiful uh, mountain towns. Um, so those are two. I'll, I'll go with uh, uh, Idaho. They, they deserve to be represented. We were just in Sun Valley this summer. That is great. And I'm, I'm just to be clear, I'm looking for inspiration on where to go next. Still, so you can open <laughs> that perspective. Kevin, where should we go next as the European Union? Well, you know, I I, I must say um, I must say California because um, I grew up there. Uh, my mom still lives there. I uh, grew up in the Monterey Bay. Went to went to school there, high school there, and law school there. Um, and um, uh, still have uh, quite a few great friendships there. 
Alicia, your I'll be controversial. Um, and I'm going to say I love Colorado. Uh, just because I grew up in Colorado Springs and um, it's just such a beautiful state. So, um, and also I took my kids to a lot of soccer tournaments in Colorado. That's great. I'm, I must say it, it is one of the favorite states I keep hearing from a lot of people I ask the question to wherever they are for whatever interest. So, but this is a wonderful collection of, of four states. We're so happy to connect with you today. Uh, this is just a conversation starter. Of course, I know emails are already being exchanged on, on the chat and there will be follow-up uh, conversations happening soon, I hope. Uh, we will break here and uh, I'll pass it on to uh, a little bit our perspective from the European Union uh, with a short introduction on how we are helping uh, companies to export uh, to Europe. Um, and uh, and that, is, uh, that is done through our EU trade help desk. We heard about you, but of course, we, we said it before, trade is a two-way street, so we're definitely looking forward uh, to, to facilitating those connections, including those personal uh, connections um, today and, and in the future. Uh, we will be breaking, and then later uh, today, uh, 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time, we will be uh, starting our, our virtual networking event um, and you'll still find the link in the chat box for those of you who haven't registered yet and who want to sign up. Uh, that's very easy and convenient um, to do. But before we go uh, with that small video on the EU Trade Help Desk, I do want to thank our wonderful panel today. Uh, I would love to visit all of you, uh, as mentioned already by the ambassador. Um, I would love to come out and, and see you in action and see your states in action and strengthen indeed our, um, our relationship and be stronger together. That's our philosophy from, from Europe. And we know we have a great partner in the United States and in the 50 states and DC, of course, that we, um, that we look forward to working with. So thank you, to my, thank you so much to Karen, David, Kevin, and Alicia, virtual applause from uh, my side. And with that, I think we're good to go to the video on the EU Trade Help Desk. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, thank you. We may have some technical issues there, but you should see very shortly the video. Product to the EU, but aren't certain what rules to follow? Then the EU Trade Help Desk is the perfect tool for you. Here you'll find all you need to know about the rules and regulations and any customs duties you'll need to pay. Let's say you want to export cocoa butter from Ghana to France. First, select your product's country of origin then choose your destination country. Next, you'll need to find the EU product code for cocoa butter. Simply click on Find My Product Code and then type Cocoa Butter in the search box. Once you've got your product code, click on Search. Now you'll see all the information about exporting cocoa butter to the EU separated into tabs. First, there is Import Procedures. This explains the customs procedures you'll need to follow. For example, the paperwork you'll need to fill out. Second, product requirements. Here you'll find the health, safety and technical standards and the labeling rules for your product. Then there is import duties. This will show you the duty you'll have to pay at customs, including any discount you might be eligible for. We also show you any other taxes that apply in the EU country you're exporting to, as these affect the final price of your product. The rules of origin help us define the economic nationality of your product, which is important when you claim a duty discount. And lastly, you'll also find how much of your product the EU imports already and from where, information you may need for your business plan, so with the EU Trade Help Desk and your great product, you'll have all you need to crack the world's biggest market.